welcome to Vacation Station, hosted by Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazines.com. Hey, everybody, welcome to Big Blend Radio's second Friday food, wine, and travel show with the International Food, Wine, Travel Writers Association. Isn't that a mouthful? But hey, food, wine, and travel, you can't beat that. We do call the organization IFTWA, it's easier to say, and you can go to their website, ifwtwa.org. And we love these shows because we get to chat with travel writers and photographers who come back and share their stories of their latest adventures. And today we get to welcome back Paula Shuck. Paula has been on our show a few years back, and she was talking about her skiing adventures in Vermont. Well, apparently her family got back out on the slopes again and also delved into some Olympic history and current uh, well winter sports activities and races and all kinds of things. So her story is up on Blend Radio and TV.com. But all the links to everything we talk about uh, is in the show notes. So no matter where you're listening to, uh, you can check that out. But also go to her website, thriftymamastips.com. So welcome back, Paula. How are you? Thank you. I am great. Yeah. I'm so happy to see you. It's always nice you to be You too. Here. So, you know, when you think about skiing and you're a thrifty mama, right? And that's mama, M-O-M-M-A, just to make sure. That's right, yeah. Um, it's, she's not a blues queen. I don't know. Maybe you do sing. I don't know. Do you sing? I do not. No, that would okay. be a bad idea. <laughs> as, as you're skiing down the slope. But um, I love that you talk about family adventures and that it can't just be all play. You've got to have something that inspires and forms and you still want to play. But um, it seems like this trip, you were that way like in regards to Olympic history and Olympic history is always inspiring. But I wanted to go like, when you think about skiing and you're a family and you're thrifty, right? And I think these days we all have to be thrifty. There's stuff going on in the world. Mm -hmm. You think of skiing, then you start to think, okay, those numbers are going up, 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 up. Is it possible to have a thrifty ski trip when you're with a family? I think it is. Absolutely. You have to look for the deals um, and go. Sometimes off season is the best time to go skiing. If you're going to a popular resort, that's um, where the lift tickets are quite expensive. Um, But what we like to do is, so we look for a little bit of off season. We look for some deals. Sometimes depending on where you go, they will have like Thursday, two for one or Thursday, $40 or things like that. Um, And you also buy, if you can, in advance passes for your family. Um, We do a lot of driving to where we're going. So that saves money often. Uh, Although the price of gas these days, it's a bit of a toss up. Um, And we take a lot of food with us. And we also stay in places that are quite affordable. So when you go, so you're based out of the Ontario area in, mm. in Canada, everybody. Um, and so when you, you went to Lake Placid, that wasn't too far of a trip, was it? It was about a seven, seven and a half hour drive, depending oh, nice. on how fast you're going, how many times you stop with kids. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, and you say you take your own food and stuff, but do you ever go out to eat? You just kind of balance it out? We balance it out, absolutely. So when we are skiing as a family, we often pack pack our coats with power bars, um, water bottles, whatever we can take with us. Because when you're at the top of the, the summit and you get hungry, right? The only places around are often really expensive um, little chalet type $10 yeah. sandwiches, $20 sandwiches. And for a family of four, that adds up really quickly. So we do take a lot of snacks with us. Um, and quite often they might stay in our ski bag in the chalet. And when we ski down to the lodge, then we take a break there, save money that way. So there's all kinds of ways that you can save. And I mean, I think we, we have been really good um, finding deals on equipment to begin with so that's that's a huge part of it the setup getting your skis getting your helmets oh wow uh, getting all of the all of the gear right and take good care of it so that it lasts a long time 
well taking good care of it now that comes into lessons for your kids too right is to understand yeah. the value of things and budgeting so do you look at travel as that way for you know there's the educational per, part of it like we'll talk about with the olympics for lake placid but um at the same time there's that real life experience to be learned there is absolutely um and so the thing about that for us as soon as our kids got to a certain age around the teen years that's when we started skiing we had not skied before that it is quite an expensive sport I was always terrified of heights believe it or not and then we had the opportunity to learn and we never looked back and the thing that I loved about it right from the start was first of all it's very family friendly you have some of your best chats with your kids on the chairlift they're just happy to be there. They're just sitting, you know, when they're sitting shoulder to shoulder and not necessarily staring at you, there's a different level of- And they're not on the phone, not on the phone? Yeah, they're not on their phone because you can't sit there. <laughs> I mean, you can, but it's not always a good idea, right? If it falls, you're, you're toast. You're dead, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, yeah. We'll again with that. Uh, yeah, no, because there's the family time, the conversations. I think that's always- it's Huge. so important. Yeah, even the drive there. So what I do not hate about uh, road trips is that, again, the same thing. Kids are in the back. They are often happy to chat with you because the atmosphere is just a, you know, we're going on holidays all together. We're going to do something really cool, really challenging. And that for us is the appeal of skiing. You get to the top of that mountain, even if you are afraid of heights, typically you have to get over it because there's only one way down, right? So when you look uh -huh. to each other for support, um, and I think that our family does a really good job of that and being patient when someone, I mean, maybe not 100% of the time, but <laughs> we're getting there. Being patient when someone hits a trail with moguls by accident and is like, oh my God, how do I get down? Um, and my husband's exceptional at just sort of waiting for the kids and he's better skier than I am. So I'll give him that. If one falls down, he's the guy hanging behind to make <laughs> sure they're getting back up. And I know they're older now, but you still have falls. It doesn't matter how old you are. And the lesson um always is get I'd, back I think I'd be back on my butt sliding down and that's yeah. going to be frozen we yeah. just we just had a, an experience in northern Wisconsin of understanding snow different I mean we went through Wisconsin a couple years ago but this was like a whole other world on top of it city versus countryside and I think we probably could have walked over to your house from there I don't know it's like Canada was just over the border my phone kept going to Canada it was oh, giving yeah, me really? the temperature was different and everything. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. But like when you fall on your butt in the snow, it's not always a soft landing. I'm just it's saying convenient. it's not. And that kind of knocked me out. I got winded a few times just trying to feed the birds. Like it was, really? yeah. 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 Cause it was ice underneath. It depends. And if you learn, right. You learn all the different types of snow and all the different types of skiing and you have to adjust and mentally oh. celebrate every single time you go out. So the first day when we went to Whiteface Mountain in Lake Placid, which is exceptional skiing, it is the highest vertical drop in the east. So I was stoked about that. I was a little bit terrified when I got to the top. It was a little bit icy. So you're already just kind of correcting and making sure for me, I need to dig in a little bit more when I'm turning to make sure I don't go flying, right? Okay. Um, whereas when it's really thick snow, it's totally different. You have to kind of coast over it a little bit or you get stuck and face plant. That would be me. Yeah. <laughs> that that's see, that's what happened. Yeah. The ice it's such a there is different snow. Like mm -hmm. I remember the first time in Wisconsin and, and the snow fell, and you know, we pets it as we travel. And you know, I called the lady, and I'm like, you told we're not supposed to have snow like this right now and I said oh well do I I can go you know sh shovel the snow and I said hey the sun's coming out should I let it melt and then do it she goes oh no no that's how we get ice here and you know and ice was falling off the roof and all kinds of it was, oh, was it? it was yeah. a wild um it was a different experience and I learned like the layers of ice from from that and how 
You're right, different. So I'm used to California snow, and that's a whole different. That's but then they got it this year. So I they got it this year, didn't they? they? Oh my god! Wow! I mean, Big Bear, oh Mammoth. I was so, watching. Yeah. I was a little bit jealous, to be honest. I was like, oh, I want to go. I want to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So do you, I know that they do. You know, they do those those lift things. Do you ever think that anybody could do it from a helicopter? Like you could jump off a helicopter and ski down a hill. Do you, has anybody that do that? Would not be, so we've talked about it and that would not be something that I would ever tackle at my age. Same as I feel about snowboarding. Um, no, it's not for me, right? It's a lot of <laughs> falling. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot of landing on your butt. It's a lot of sitting in the snow. So pass. No. <laughs> so people do do that. They oh, do jump. <gasps> Wow. So let's talk about Lake Placid because I've always heard like just like really more in the summer part more than snow, right? So yeah. you're talking about this, this was a seat like the, one of the first Winter Olympic sites. So and I know Canada is pretty big on Winter Olympics, uh, you know, yeah. so this is kind of a nice tie in for you guys. But this was like one of wasn't it the third Olympic spot for winter winter Olympic sports? It was. It was the third ever Winter Olympics in 1932, which I think I think that's a lesser known fact than the 1980 Olympics. I think everybody's pretty familiar that Lake Placid had the 1980 Olympics, yeah. um, and that I grew up watching that. It was so exciting. My aunt and uncle went to Lake Placid afterwards, uh, and I remember these sort of cachet around well we held the olympics here but um i think what's interesting about that is if you follow the olympics at all and you travel then you know sometimes destinations struggle after that to find their footing mm -hmm. um, and to move forwards um and not just to sort of rest on that little event specific tourist draw so i think lake placid has done a really great job of that i was especially mm -hmm. especially blown away by the olympic museum which has just had a massive update um and we love museums as a family we were dead exhausted the day that we went after skiing at whiteface all day um but so glad we did not miss it you, if you go you need to put that at the top of your list, um, regardless of the time of year, because they have one of the biggest collections of Olympic artifacts in North America. They wow. have, yeah, they have everything from the Olympic posters that they roll out globally. So a collection of art display of every Olympic poster you could imagine. All of the, I don't think there were any missing at all. All of the Olympic torches, from every opening ceremony, which they're so artistic and you have to just sort of go, wow, like they are um, such a testament, testimony to- Well, it's a, it's a big deal. The torches, the Olympic torches are the sign of it. Yeah. And that is the, the yeah, and people who get to carry them. And that's a huge, that that is the symbol, you know, and I, I think it's interesting because you have, you know, the Eiffel Tower behind you for those watching, you know, um, but for those not watching, that's what Paula has a picture of the Eiffel Tower behind her. And we did an interview. There was a, a guy who wrote a book about Pierre Coubertin, who wrote and he was the god, the grandfather of the Olympics. And if you go into the history of the Olympics, it was about world peace. That was the main thing of it. And people getting together and doing I mean we it goes way back when and it was about peace but it has been an up and down ride for quite a while and so I think that's interesting going you know so you're in France there um of course Canada has French heritage right yes. but but you think about this and go you know when the Olympics come to town it is a big deal and it's important to just remember why it was a spirit of competitiveness, exactly. but it was nations coming together to exactly. do that. It's nations coming together. It's people achieving something that is a lifelong goal and so admirable that they train all their lives to compete for maybe a short amount of time on one day, right? And mm -hmm. everything rides on that. It's just a beautiful, to me, it's a really inspiring story to see some of the um actual 
like the artifacts, the whole narrative of the Olympics. And then at the Olympic Museum, there's this huge um, sort of focus on the 1980 Olympics and the miracle on ice and the Cold War that was going on at that time. See, that's what I'm saying, the wars. Yeah, that's that huge history. Yeah, wow. yeah. So, and the triumph of the human spirit over that, like the underdog team sort of um, just pulling together and uh, that, I get goosebumps thinking about it. Yeah, when you were there, I, mean, I know travel writer Debbie Stone, um, is, you know, she's been on our shows for years, but also is also an IFTWA member. Yeah. And she went to the Olympics Museum twice in Colorado Springs. And now, you know, they've got two, they, they just keep expanding, expanding. And yeah. she said that when she went to that, she says, I don't care if you don't know anything about sports. Here I am, everybody. Um, she yeah. goes, you're going to find these stories to be inspiring and we found that into the Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame and I don't know much but by the time I left there I was like I'm gonna run down the streets I'm gonna be yeah. Rambo you know what I mean so exactly. you know those, those are those moments of the Rambo moments just had to make reference to the 80s <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you had to go back there but yeah did you feel that way too like that inspiration did you you know you said you were Absolutely. all exhausted after skiing the day before by the time you walked out were you feeling like let's go ski again now and Absolutely. know what you skied over like Absolutely. this is where and, these athletes were and it just kind of reminds me you know what when you put your mind to it sometimes you can achieve whatever you want to and you know, you might have limits, you all have a different story, you all have different backgrounds, but I think it's inspiring to think that no matter where you come from in the world, you can, you can decide at, uh, there are some stories of individuals who only started like in later life and mm. I love that. You no, know, that's sports, right? That's, mm -hmm. to me, that's, that's why we do it when you come out of uh, a place like Lake Placid and you're exhausted from all the physical activity, but you're also inspired to keep trying to do better and to apply that to your mental state and your mindset for everything for the next, you know, hopefully long term. Mm. When, when you actually do the sport and you connect it to this Olympic history, does it change when you talk about how you, you know, that mental part? And by the way, the physical exhaustion is such a good exhaustion. That's a good, happy, you've got all those endorphins going, your body's like, yippee, I, yay, I moved, I got things going around, the oxygen's flowing, the blood is pumping, it's all happy. I'm tired, but it feels good. But um, when you get all of that going, and then these stories, does it change you in you know I know you also work in marketing and mm -hmm. social media especially for IFTWA right mm -hmm. and your blog um so you have all these things that you do and you're a mom I mean you, you know that list is adding up um when you hear these stories that is does it kind of give you clarity and focus does it help inspire you in your professional and then just even in your family life because you have to juggle all these different things yeah yeah, it inspires me to want to travel more, to want Ooh. to try Ooh. more things always, regardless of age or ability or obstacles, um, and to get outside. Like mm. Lake Placid just made me want to be outside regardless of the weather, regardless of the season. It's so gorgeous. It's also so, the little main street is so walkable um, and inviting right? Yeah. So I would happily go back anytime, try any other sports. Now, one thing that we did not get to do when we were there, but we saw was at Mount Van Hovenberg. They do cross country. We did some snowshoeing there, which was oh, amazing. That's cool. Loved it. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, and the kids had fun doing that as well. Um, but there's a bobsledding experience there that I would highly recommend. It looked so fun. We just ran out of time that day. And also you need to make reservations if you want to do that. So I want to do the bobsledding. You it know what so I want? Yeah. When you, I want to play cool runnings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I want to do that too. You we know, what, what are they called? Terrified. There were kids that looked and adults that looked terrified when they were hopping in but thrilled when they got out so we could oh see. that's cool 
on the screen. Yeah, I, but this, the winter sports is so fascinating, you know, about how it all works and, you know, even driving there. So this is something you can do in winter, but then the museums, like I know we're now in Summerland, right? It's it's mm. National Outdoors Month here in June in, in, this, in uh, America anyway. I don't know if it's in Canada too, but um, over in, in the States, it's Outdoors Month. So it's a good time to talk about it and even plan. So when you were talking about being thrifty, would you say that people should start planning now as soon as you can for your winter, you know, adventure? Absolutely, because you're going to get the best deals on passes now in May, if you're planning or June or um, months before you go, you'll get the best deals on the destinations. And if you're looking at something really specific that your whole family wants to do, like that bobsled experience, I would lock it in as soon as you can. And the other piece of information to know is those restaurants are so popular in Lake Placid that you need to make reservations. We learned the hard way the first night and we were like, oh man. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, we were, um, we had a list, we had a number of um, restaurants that we thought sounded great. And I asked the locals as soon as I got there, what, what do you recommend? Um, and the top one, oh my gosh, I can't remember the name now. I'll think of it, send it to you later. Um, it was full and it was full the entire time we were there. So I was like, ah, darn. Another time I would go back, I would make reservations well before we flew okay. or drove or anything. Yeah. Now, what time of year did you go? So we went in February. So okay. yeah, it was winter. It was spring break here, which aligned with spring break in a couple of other mm -hmm. states. So, and by spring break, I mean, my one daughter is in university. So it comes a little earlier than the March timeframe. Mm. It was in February. Um, so peak snow was happening several places. We got a snowstorm by the time we left the state. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah. I think I was in it. <laughs> yeah, you probably were. Yeah. I don't know where I was, but I'm sure I was in it. Because all I know is everywhere we went, there was some kind of storm somewhere. <laughs> It was a lot of late snow this year, um, late February, March, but we were there in February. It was crazy busy because mm -hmm. people want to ski in February. Okay. So, and then summer, it sounds like you could do a lot in summer too. You so can. that's, that sounds something. I love New York state. Um, we, we went through there last year Yeah, on our way to Michigan and went down through the Erie Canal area and just this whole I didn't, I knew it was beautiful. I know Explore Steuben is part of IFTWA, one of the associate members, and they were on the show recently. And I mean, we saw signs to Cornwall and we had timing, right? You know, you can't do everything, but I'm like, I want to go. We talked to them over there and it sounds like so much fun. And, but it was so beautiful. And, um, yeah. you know, because I think a lot of times we think of New York and we forget about upstate New York, you know, so it's New York is New York City. Yeah. Yeah. And so like Thanks what you're talking about for Lake Placid and everything just sounds so gorgeous and something to look at year round. Cause when you have big snow, that means you probably have fall colors. You got Absolutely. beautiful summers. It's probably gorgeous right now. Beautiful you know, summer and fall hiking everywhere mm. you see behind you, you can hike. Mm. Yeah. I want to do that. I want to do the cross country skiing, but I don't know. I, and, and the snowshoeing, that sounds like fun, snowshoeing. but, um, Going back to some of the things you were talking about in your articles about how they are working about being more environmentally friendly um, in regards to the resorts and the skiing places. It seems like they're on a kick to um, help mitigate climate change and, you know, be be conscious and makes us better travelers, too. And maybe we take it home, too. They are. Absolutely. And I mean, it's such an inspiring, beautiful green kind of environment to begin with you're inspired to be outdoors um and do all these things but at the same time i recognize skiing and outdoor sports can be hard on the environment if you're not approaching them with the mindset of being a steward of the land and not mm -hmm. leaving it in worse shape than when you got there and when i read about um destinations that are doing things like looking into hybrid equipment for snowmaking 
Mm -hmm. um, looking into LED lighting, looking into any other ways that they can refit some of the equipment or change some of the equipment to be more friendly to the environment. I'm more inclined to want to visit that kind of destination and support that kind of mentality mm -hmm. because it aligns with us as a family and our priorities as well long term. I mean I think a lot of ski resorts have a long way to go still, but I think Whiteface and Lake Placid and the Olympic Regional Development Authority are working together to make everything just a little gentler for the environment and future forward, right? That's a very positive way to plan for future travel, I think. Yeah, and, and it gets us on board. That's mm -hmm. what I was saying. I think it, it does, and for youth to know and you know, and I think the youth are doing a lot for in regards to mm -hmm. climate change. I mean, they're, I mean, yeah. I know a lot of people are always putting down the millennials and the young and, and like, oh, you know, stop it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But the way that they travel, like I watch my kids, right? And their mentality is totally different to the way that they purchase, the way that they make decisions, um, the way that we market to them. Also, put my marketing hat on for a second. Has oh, to yeah, be yeah. completely different as well because their values are quite a lot different than ours were at their age right so they make decisions based on your values as a destination sometimes which mm -hmm. i think if you're smart like lake placid you're planning ahead and thinking mm -hmm. okay hopefully paula's kids are coming with their kids mm -hmm. how can we make that a vision for the future, right? Yeah, because you want the kids to come back, but also you want the place to be there, you know, through exactly. climate change and things like that. And I think, yeah, you're really right. Kids are like, hey, are you thinking about me? Period. Yeah. Like, are you thinking about our future? And looking at that, and like, I remember, you know, when I was a teenager, when I first got to this country and had come out of South Africa, and I was completely naive. We both were. Nancy and I were both naive to the marketing of this country at that point of how suddenly I was getting credit cards in the mail and you know, uh oh, that's a dangerous thing. If you yeah. don't have the knowledge of what the credit card companies are doing, how they rope you in. I mean, it's kind of like that. So when we think about marketing, the kids now are so much smarter than what I was with all of that stuff, that if you're trying to rope me in, oh, you know, you could, you could lose your business eventually. Yeah. Just saying. Yeah. I'm just going to tell you a little aside. Also, I think that kids, um, millennials, Gen Z, and younger are also processing with different lenses like diversity, equity, yes. inclusion lenses mm -hmm. are huge. So when they travel, they're thinking, is this a destination that I really want to go to? What's their political stance on X, mm -hmm. Y, or Z? And they're thinking all those things through because I know my kids are. Um, and even tiny things like what I noticed about New York State, and I really want to call it out, is everywhere we went, almost everywhere we went, um, they had gender inclusive bathrooms. And that might yes. be a small yep. thing. That's it's a big not. deal. It's a massive deal. And my kids noticed it and they literally lit up seeing them when we stopped and there was a gender diverse bathroom. It, to them, it signaled belonging. Mm -hmm. Whereas we passed through a couple of other states and there was nothing like that. And I could see the attitude completely like. Well, the rest areas, like, you know, we travel full time. We're doing parks and public mm -hmm. land. So we see a lot. And the rest areas, um, we know what states you go. Oh, no, you better pee, get gas before you go over. Um, yes. You know, yeah. you, better, you know what I mean? And, you you know, it, it, it does get like that in New York State. It's that's interesting because. We were like, they're set up and they're smart and they're 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 savvy, financially pretty darn savvy, actually, the way things are done and planned. Like that's where we're like, this is interesting, even how the toll road system works and how everything's right there. And they've I mean, they're smart as a it's a smart business move, like what they've done. It is. You I know? agree with you. Yeah. And you it's know? very future 
forward and I love that so I like that term I, I like that because I think we have to and as you know not being the I still think I'm 19 that I but I can drink wine but I could drink wine when I was in South Africa so you know yeah so I'm allowed but I still feel like I'm 19 but I'm so I'm not but but it's I feel like it it's important that we acknowledge these and as we're traveler writers it's really great and to hear you from a mom's position be able to see these changes because I even think traveling with kids um it's funny because even when we're recording tomorrow we have a really cool podcast coming out so everyone it would have already aired but um with Steve Piacenti he's a, a life coach and a parent grandparent now and he was doing this podcast talking about what can what do we learn from kids as parents and as kids and we were talking about traveling with kids and how their brains are thinking how they are I mean it's kind of a really interesting thing to see what's going on now. Yes. You know, comments and I mean, they can use a phone better than adults, you know, and a four-year-old can make decisions. <laughs> yeah. You know? you're so, so it's kind of scary, but what would you say about mm -hmm. traveling with kids that teaches you something and that, you know, maybe people in the tourism industry should travel with kids to see what it's like and not just be watching it from their hotel or restaurant or resort or attraction but actually do it because I know when I traveled and did some you know stuff with friends with kids mm -hmm. that you know I'm already a real slow traveler in that I want to see every little insect on a plant and I'm like annoying to hike yeah. with if you yeah. if you want to be fast and fit don't go with me but <laughs> watching it through this little girl's eyes that was like those were those things where she kind of put the sense of wonder back into how we travel, how we view things, yeah. how to be observant and not be so scared either. And I think as adults, we have a very negative, the older we get, the more negative we have because we've been through things that taught Absolutely. us. Oh yeah. Stuff can go down more. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they have different fresh eyes. They have different viewpoints and takes and, all of that, I think, is really interesting to experience. Also, it's really kind of cool when you travel to see them blossom and learn things and what sticks with them and what destinations they remember. And sometimes it's not what you think. Like you go on the big family cruise and it's fun and you're zip lining and you're doing all these things and you think, well, that's probably the top of their list. And then one day they're sitting around talking to you and it's like, no, actually, this was the best day I've had in a really long time. And it was Lake Placid skiing and whiteface, or it was when we went fishing, bass fishing in Missouri, Lake of the Ozarks. And you're like, really? All the places we've been. So it's interesting to see what resonates, what sticks, what's important to them. I think that's really uh, a cool thing to watch. And also, so because I'm in social media, I'm always watching, what are they doing? How are they consuming social media? Um, and what's going to happen with TikTok, man? I'm watching that. Like, you know, what, people keep saying that to me too, right? It's like, what, what's going to happen? And I'm on there for a little bit and then I like bail off of it for a while. But I'll go back, you know, it's, there's like a political thing. That's a security yeah. thing. I know. And but so I it's, it's really interesting what's happening in social media to, to see like, what's, yeah. you know, are we, are we all going to go and work social media according to our own ages as travel writers and destinations? That's something to think about just because you may like Facebook. Facebook's now getting older and older. Instagram, younger and younger. TikTok. So are you going to only do what you think and know? You've got to now, you better, you, I think we have to truly connect. Otherwise it looks stupid. Yeah, <laughs> you know I mean? yeah absolutely. You can't be cool um, in front of kids that are already cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? True. TikTok is so important to them. I struggle when people say it's going to be banned. I'm like, you know how big TikTok is globally? I don't understand how you're going to ban that and put the genie back in the bottle. I don't think it's doable. There may be places where they're restricting it and states, I think it's bigger than the US than it is in Canada, this discourse about banning TikTok. 
-hmm. But um, when I watch that generation and how much they consume TikTok and how fast it's grown, number one, it is a little bit of, a little bit scary the amount of permission and information that kids throw onto TikTok without the lens of maybe Security. I should yeah. leave all that out there for everyone to gather yeah. or know. Um, but also I just think like bite-sized consumable, really quick punchy videos here to stay. I don't think they're going anywhere. No. So and I think it's also interesting to watch how kids are being so creative. I shouldn't even call them kids. I hate that. Youth yeah. are, are so creative. So we can get, you know, like way about them on phones and everything, but they are actually being very creative. I mean, if you think about yeah. the entrepreneurs of today so many of them started in you know at home at a very you know 14 13 12 year old look at there's so many now yeah out there and they're like i just want to get through school i want to fit i want to do this and i i know i you know my best friend's daughter is like working in a marketing agency now because she could make that option from living in england am i going to go and stay in school and college or am i going to take these opportunities that i have because she's so good at it I mean, wow. she is yeah. up there and you can legally do all that. And she knows what she wants to do. And I'm like looking at her going, this is freaking amazing. I can't talk to her mom without her going, well, you can also do this. You, like, you need to do this. You need to do that. I'm like, okay, I'll listen, you know, because yeah. she's really good. And it's like, wow, they get it. Me I think too. they were born yeah. with algorithms. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And um video editing skills that's such an undervalued um skill set mm -hmm. but so necessary for anyone working in social media and i think i mean you're right we don't know what careers are going to be 10 years from now there's no way um what i do every day with social media managing a team of people who do social media in my full-time job um, is nothing that even existed 20 years ago or no. 30 years ago when I was in university. So it is really hard. And if my um, teenager was here listening to me right now, I would be sunk that I had even said this. <laughs> but it's really hard to say, you know, stay off of TikTok. Why are you spending all your time on TikTok? When in fact, I mean, those skills that they're learning, video editing, um, communicating, creating a network building a brand yes and they're doing question a brand but it's okay um it's all transferable exactly things? once you take those skills you can that's yes. what's i think it's and that's the other thing is when you're when destinations like lake placid are doing the right thing because you can you can market all you want but if you don't have what you say and people go there your marketing is going to kill you you know it's like everybody goes oh it's all word of mouth well you better be really good right um yeah. no matter what you do because now you know instagram tiktok all of that that's like a you know every guest is like a potential marketer <laughs> you know, for your resort and your destination so exactly. you have to have those things there in place for them like you say in your marketing so when they go there it is and they can go look what i found and people also want to be the first ones to showcase there's also that they do everyone is a potential influencer that shows up in your destination you don't know always right and you don't know their reach or their network um and i think there's a huge piece of customer service training that destinations like lake placid seem to get and be aware of so it's integrated into their mindset i didn't see any negative whatsoever when I was there. I mean, we weren't there for that long, but I'm just saying there are places where you go and you're super disappointed in the customer service and you think that is a PR, night PR nightmare waiting to happen when an influencer shows up here and is just happening to tape something. This is not one of those destinations. It just felt like everything was done well from the start. New York was welcoming even from the get-go, right? Mm. Here you're at Placid Bay Hotel when we arrived, 
here's your s'mores kit. Here's your campfire. Okay, you got the s'mores. Go sit out there and stare at this beautiful mountain in the dark. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh. But that's that's, that's the thing. I, I like what you're saying about that too, is it's the friendliness because I think like you're saying, the Olympics to keep, you know, cities build up this infrastructure. I remember, you know, we lived in Port Elizabeth, South Africa, and, and the Olympics went out in well, the whole Cape, like it spread out all of it. It was a World Cup, not the Olympics, the World okay. Cup, and it, and it made a big deal. Um, you know, but the World Cup is a big deal. I'm sorry, soccer fan here. Yeah, uh, sure. Football when I'm on the other side of the pond. But yeah. it's it's a big deal. And well, here, it's, it's a big deal for America, too. Um, now, but it's, it, all this infrastructure now what are they going to do with it exactly. was it worth the investment what did you do to put all this infrastructure did you tear anything down right exactly so when with lake placid it seems like they have pride over the olympic heritage and are keeping up with the ideals of what the olympics were founded to do you know and you're wearing olympic colors today so you get 10 points <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly how I felt about Lake Placid and being there. And um, everything that we visited, even the ski jumping complex, it all seemed to be working towards uh, an integrated sort of story that aligned with their values as New York State, right? That's cool. So yeah, that's a very authentic kind of experience, I think, is what I want awesome. to say there. Yeah. Yeah. So where's next for you? So where's next for me? I am working on a few different things. I'd love to get out east to Nova Scotia or oh. Newfoundland this summer. Cool. Um, I'm hearing this summer is going to be a crazy travel mm. year. Crazy, crazy travel. It's already season. happening. So, yeah. yeah, we will see if I can make that happen. I want to make it happen really soon. And I'm dying to get to Portugal. Oh, yeah. I want to go too. I'll yeah. Go. I want to go to, I mean, really want to go to Portugal. Yeah. Really, yeah. really, really, really want to go to Portugal. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a thing. I was going to ask. Um, so the cruise that is coming up for the conference for IFTWA, that's happening in October. So people, if you go to ifwtwa.org, check it out. And even if you're not a member of IFTWA, it is worthwhile going. And this is going to be a cruise. So it touches, you know, Vancouver. So it's, you know, yes. this is this is a North American cruise, quite frankly, right? Because it goes yes. all the way down to Southern California. So um, you may want to check that out pretty soon, not only for travel writers and photographers and authors, but actual destinations. And I mean, even if you're a winery, you could be a member or non-member and go to the, uh, the conference, which is fun. And I think there's so much networking for you. What what's the what's your you know main goal of of you know not goal should I say but you, know, you go into an organization with goals and what you want um, out of it. But what's your favorite part of being a member? Because you've been a member for a while now. For yeah, I want to say six years now. Anyways, yeah. Um, so my main goal in joining was to find a network of like-minded individuals and just access some of their knowledge um, and their network and learn about the destinations that uh, were part of the organization. Mm -hmm. And I think that we've got a lot of exposure, potential exposure to destinations, to um, a reach, a network of other writers that amplifies everyone's mm -hmm. content. Mm -hmm. For instance, which that matters to me as someone who, you know, blogs, writes, um, posts on Instagram, all of that. And I think it's a really good reciprocal kind of arrangement in which you make genuine friendships and you put in the effort to be part of the organization and to join a committee or two um, and maybe do a podcast once in a while. Uh, you have lots of opportunities to grow. Mm -hmm. So that's very, very worthwhile to me. Um, and, you know, since the pandemic started, one thing that IFTWA has done is some amazing webinars. and training. Wasn't it cool? They really just kept going during the pandemic. You know, it was so refreshing to see. It really was. Yeah. And I attended every one that I could during the first, I think, 
two years. It's hard to say that now. Two years of the pandemic. Wow. Well, yeah. Amazing, yeah. <laughs> but um, and they were all really great. Mm. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I think I think they've done an excellent job. And I love that, you know, they are international in regards to the food, wine, and travel part, but also growing that international base of members, which I think is really exciting to see yes, a, a lot of bigger Canadian initiative for that. Yeah, yeah, Canadians, Australians, you know, um, it's exciting. So uh, very cool. Well, it was great to have you back on the show. Thanks for joining us and doing all that social media work that you do because you always tweet our shows as well. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, we love seeing the posts. And one of my favorite things about IFTWA is watching the social media channels because if you want to take a few moments off and go for some armchair travel and get ready to plan your next destination is you follow if on instagram twitter uh facebook it, all those places um and also you're on everything too right and and it's all under thrifty mamas and ink scribbler ink scribbler ink on scribbler twitter. that's right and on instagram yeah yeah, I'm on everything. I even dabble on TikTok because I kind of oh. have you as part of the job, right? Just ah, that's it. Yeah. That's it. Uh, so everyone, again, uh, Paula's article is up on blendradioandtv.com, but I'm going to have that link in the show notes as well. Um, and I'll probably, I'll put in the show notes also about Pierre Coubertine. So you have that history of um, the Olympics too, which is really cool. Um, but also keep up with us where on every second Friday, we chat with writers uh, from IFTWA every second Tuesday, it's associate members, which means we're talking about the destinations, tour companies. Uh, also every third Monday, we do the same thing. And every third Friday, we talk with different travel writers about a group theme. Sometimes it's a panel discussion. And sometimes it's like, here's a theme and we get separate interviews. So you can hear uh, what they all think from different perspectives. It just all depends because everybody's out traveling. I'm like, come on, get in there, girls and boys. <laughs> we need you for your podcast. Uh, but it's all great. So again, ifwtwa.org and keep up with us at bigblendradio.com. And for Paula, keep up with her at thriftymamastips.com. Thanks so much, Paula. Thank you so much, Lisa.